So this is really neat. Actually, I'll, t I'll talk to you about this a little bit. This, in, in this particular uh, geographical area, this is a natural resource that was really elegantly utilized by the population uh, that, that was proximal to it. The guys looked at this uh, oak hammock and they realized what they had was a shade house. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to build anything, right? It's already a shade house. So what do the guys do? They went in and they went ahead and they put their irrigation and they grew ferns in these, in these natural shade houses. And I don't think that this is done in too many places. You know, I think that's a pretty unique, unique little bit of uh, thinking. You know, you find a resource like this and, and look at it and think, oh, what have we got a shade house here? Pretty neat. That's one of, the, one of the things actually that would be very interesting to be able to do with this orchard project, specifically because it allows us to pool a very interesting collection of genetic material of germplasm into a single place, would be to have the opportunity to put in place a, a propagation house and have as a package coming out of this project, not just the package of knowledge about how to use these cover crops and the animals and the full coverage irrigation and the multi-tiered farmscaping and you know the uh the diversity in the in the tree material itself but also have the germplasm available to do it like so right out of here you can do it you know have be able to propagate the, the species of trees that do the best, much as they're doing on the cattle section of this farm. You know, part of the mission of the cattle section of this farm is to, is to keep working the genetics of that cattle, right? To keep making those cows better and better and better for what they do at what they do. And so what a great thing to be able to, to at the end of the day, produce cattle that are so good at doing that job of healing the land that they're grazing and then be able to uh, introduce those cattle out into local agro systems that could benefit from them or introduce the, uh, the, the genetic material of these uh, tree species that we find to be most appropriate to dovetail into this type of production. And uh, I hope that that's something that we'll be able to do here on this project. You know, that's another, another great thing, maybe propagation. So guys, I don't know if you wanna look at this, but this is pretty neat. You know, those, those men who farm with uh, chemicals are not bad men. They're farmers, just like any other farmer, you know? And as soon as, they, anyone, as soon as a person can see that there's a way to do it that is as profitable or will allow them to keep their farm and be good simultaneously, they'll be embraced. And it's happening. It's happening. As these systems are developed, people are coming around. I really believe it can be done. Most of our fruit crops that are really worth growing as far as something that you would... Uh, really consider something as part of an agri system tend to be light lovers and don't really like being in the understory. You know, they'll, a lot of those crops, will, they'll, they'll grow in the understory. I mean, they'll survive, but they're not gonna produce in the understory. You know, the, the reality is, you know, yeah, could you put an avocado right there? Would it die? No, it'll grow. Are you really gonna get any avocados off of that tree? No, you're not gonna get any avocados. And that's kind of like the food forest dream, right? Is that you're going to be able to build this multi-story thing and it's going to actually yield at levels that are... Huh. I got you guys turned around. Here, let me... Yeah, you know, there's a lot of guys nearby me that inoculate logs with shiitake mushrooms. And you, you might be able to do something in that oak grove with shiitake. That's kind of an interesting idea, like in inoculating logs and loading it up, maybe finding some of the ends of those old... Yeah, just get stumps and... This way. And being able to kind of use those... Uh, groves to produce mushrooms, it would, it would seem like it would work, right? It seems like the ideal environment for them. Yeah. It seems warm and cozy, like, and it's way up, it would hold in some kind of... Yeah. Insulation, if I've got enough. 
And it does. It doesn't frost under there easily. Under those, under those oak canopies, it's much more difficult to get a frost event. We have an orange growing from the rootstock of an orange tree that died back during a freeze. Oh and, uh, my gosh. So, so this is very common in Florida in uh, unprotected fields where they're not doing any active freeze protection. Um, that's another reason they use those little micro jet sprinklers in orange groves is they do an excellent job of uh, keeping the canopy temperature above the critical level so that that way you can only lose the outside edge of your trees and have a tree the next season. So you, 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 you make sure you preserve your, your uh, budwood above the of above the graft union you you can't always protect the outside of the tree but with those little those little jets you can do a pretty good job uh maintaining the inside they used to think that the heat of vaporization of the freezing of the water was enough to keep the uh the inside of the ice sheath from ever getting below 32 degrees or below freezing you know so as long as you're continuously forming ice your tree uh can't freeze right but the problem is you encase the tree with so much ice, you break the tree. So you just kill the tree either way. So now using these little micro jets, what, the, what they try to do is use a lot less water. Uh, they still use a lot of water, but use a lot less water and just use the heat of the underground water to keep these trees from freezing. You know, just keep as much of that in the air as possible and hope you can make it. Truth is, we probably should just grow citrus somewhere warmer. Yeah. This is really sour. That's sour, sour. Here, try it. Really sour. Guys. Tell me. Like, <laughs> that's the field where we have. That's an interesting field. So that field is better drained than like that Mayaka soil that I showed you before, but not as well drained as a soil that I would want to use for trees. But probably perfect for pasture that can have. Uh, very easily, lots of perennial peanut. Really, really would be fantastic improved pasture. Really would be a good place to probably do sugar cane. Um, really good place to do vegetables. Just a nice, that's a nice field. I really like that field. I'm really glad I'm getting the opportunity to improve that field. So that's, that's an interesting spot. Not good for trees, but probably one of the better fields on the farm and uh, a good field to improve and have in our toolbox for whatever it is we decide to do with it. So probably we'll improve it right now using, a, you know, one of those diverse cover crop blends. We'll start accumulating some uh, organic matter and building the field up. And then when we decide to either put it as perennial peanut pasture mixed with grass, or we decide to plant or do that and put into rows of sugar cane or whatever it is we decide to do with it. You know, interesting, interesting. Uh, oh, we didn't talk about this one. Okay, so this is my little, little field here. On this little field is fun because it's our, our little vineyard patch. So you're gonna have, on the far side there, you're gonna have your uh, grapes. they would be muscadine because those are the ones we can manage organically here. Um, maybe noble, and there's a bunch of other decent ones that we can grow. So we're gonna have some grape trellis. And in here, we're gonna have a blackberry patch. There's a couple of varieties of uh, thornless blackberry that uh, grow very well here. So we'll have some thornless blackberry and we're gonna have blueberry up the hill over there on the right. So that's your grapes, blueberries and blackberries. We're not even gonna mix them up. We're just gonna keep them on really wide spacings. We're gonna give them plenty of room and we're gonna make sure that we have uh, nice things planted in between them and keep them mulched in the, in the rows and see how we do. Hopefully we don't need to push that into like really radical polyculture because they're Already, blueberries already have a fairly demanding set of nutritional requirements, especially regarding low pH. They like low pH. And then that's hard to mix with other stuff. You'd need other low pH things. And I hope we can just grow a plain old regular block of blueberries there. But, you know, maybe if we keep it small and we keep the diversity all around it and running through it, we don't have to stagger the blueberry plants with anything else. At least that's what I hope. So this is our pond site, huh? Right in here. So right across from the four-way field on the other side of the ditch, right? Just to the north also of this uh, nine-way field here, this long thin one. Right beside our uh, berry patch here. I want to show you this now because I want to do this again when everything's here. And when you look over there, you're going to see a pond. 
It's an L shape, kind of looks like a boomerang like this, like that, right? And there's a wetland in here, right? And that wetland flows back out into a creek that runs that way. And what we wanna do is we wanna create this entire edge of this pond is gonna be uh, hopefully a geo web reinforced overflow. And so what you're gonna see as you walk along here, like from here, you can see where the soil's high, right? And the soil's higher here. And you're gonna drop off to the water level, maybe, you know, hopefully, eh, one, two feet, and when the water's at a decent height underground. So you're gonna see this edge of the pond, you're gonna go down into the water. But the far edge of the pond, when you look across that pond, across that boomerang that goes like this, that wraps that wetland, that whole lip feeding into the wetland, the water is gonna be at the height of the lip because there's a drop in the grade. And so it'll be a really cool thing to look at. And what that allows us to do is use the pond as a tool to settle out any sediment or on-farm runoff or you know anything that's going on gets to settle out in that pond. The pond acts as a you know, retent and then uh, it all flows over the edge of the pond into a wetland. The wetland gets to act as a functional wetland and filter again the water that we retained in the pond. So if we do go ahead and let's say we put a little bit of liquid fish out, right? And we put a little bit of liquid fish out, but right on the tail of doing it, it rains and it rains lots. I can't hold that water. I only, like I told you, right? I got two inches of water and then all of it comes out. So uh, that liquid fish, little as I may be to lose it, it's gonna go. Where's it gonna go? It's not gonna be a big deal. It's gonna come here. It's gonna go in that pond. It's gonna fertilize all the pond plants. It's gonna overflow into the wetland. The wetland's gonna do its thing. Wetland's gonna grow a little extra that day. And then every, the wall of water's gonna be clear while it heads back to the lake. And it allows me to put that pond in a place where, look how close to the surface the water is here. So this little bit of land, I got this little bit of land that's low enough to be close to the water, but not so low that it's a wetland. And so the wetland starts, unfortunately, right inside my pond site. So what do we do? We, we reorganize the shape of our pond to kind of uh, hold on to that wetland like this on the, on the inside, you know? So, but look how, look how shallow the water is here. Look how, that's, you got no, no wasted digging. You get the water right away. And that, what that pond will allow us to do is irrigate without using aquifarian water, which is awesome, surface water only. Not, not my first choice as far as being uh, the most efficient way to do it, but certainly the most ecologically efficient way to do it.